All right, hello everyone. Mm -hmm. Sorry for the false alarm. Uh, LinkedIn doesn't like me today, so I will not be streaming on LinkedIn, but that's fine. Welcome to today's uh, CLE uh, podcast session uh, in which we'll be talking about debt recovery or how to get your money back. Um, a bit about me, my name is Hugh Smith. I'm an associate here at the Chamberlain's Canberra office. I am in the litigation and restructuring team under the litigation division. Um, and I'm very, very excited to be here today to be presenting about, well, debt recovery, but more specifically, enforcement. Um, enforcement, let's, let's get right into it, shall we? Enforcement really uh, is something that people often don't talk about when they're first talking about their cases. You have a client come to you or someone owes you money under a deed or whatever, and everyone's amped up, ready to go. They want to talk about the law. They say you advise your client or you have a really good winning case uh, and you get stuck in. What I found is that often from the very, very beginning, hello everyone, how are you going on, on Instagram? Uh, what I found from the very beginning uh, is that it's great to talk about this with your client. I mean, you don't necessarily need to advise on it. Um, and in fact, you probably don't want to because it's wasted expenses, but it's something that you should have a chat about, be it enforcement, recoverability, or really, you know, the financial pressure of getting this settlement and the fact that at the end of the day, it's often the case that you win your case, you've done really well, you get a judgment in your favor, you get costs in your favor, and then uh, you provide it to the other side or they get it and the other side are like, well, I'm not gonna pay you. Um, and it can be really draining after you've been through, what, two years, maybe one year of your lucky worth of litigation, and then you don't get paid at the end of the day, even though you have this judgment in your favor, um, and you have to go through the enforcement proceedings. Uh, and it can often or sometimes result in a breakdown of what is a great relationship between you and your client due to litigation fatigue. So if you address this at the start and manage expectations um, and empower your client with the knowledge of how the enforcement process generally goes, um, it, it leads to what I find to be a long-term and sustainable relationship where everyone's up front with each other, everyone knows the expectations and, and you work through these issues together. Litigation, as we all know, is, is a long, difficult and drawn out process. Um, it is often arbitrary. Enforcement proceedings especially are arbitrary. Um, some of them have their pros, some of them have their cons. Um, and it's always good to, to be empowered um, or to empower your client and to be empowered to talk about these things from the get-go so we know how we want things to end. If you're lucky, you won't have to go down the enforcement route. You'll get a judgment against someone and then they'll just pay up and it's all sorted. But if you do need to go through these, um, you know, it's good to have the general knowledge at least. Now in this CLE, I propose only to talk generally about uh, how enforcement proceedings go. I practice predominantly in the ACT. So the wording that I use might be slightly different to the wording you have in New South Wales, Victoria, uh, Queensland, what have you. Um, and a fun fact that I discussed with, with a colleague of mine at this firm was that although there is uniform civil procedure legislation in most states around the country, in the ACT, uh, it is not the case. We have the court procedure rules, which, you know, they're broadly the same, but they have their quirks. So the joys of practicing in this jurisdiction <clears throat> mostly uh, is that we get to, you know, ex expose and engage in these quirks. Um, having said that, this is a broad overview of all of the enforcement proceedings, uh, what one can do in them, the pros and cons, issues that I've had, and the odd war story. Um, however, it is not the case that um, it's very different across different jurisdictions. Um, and so without further ado, I'll get stuck in. A bit of background about me though, I was admitted as a solicitor in New South Wales, so I do have a broad understanding of the UCPR there. Um, thank you for uh, fixing my technical difficulty, Savannah. Um, I do have a broad understanding uh, there. And uh, so if you have any questions, be it about the UCPR in, in any of the states or in the ACT specifically, depending on where you are from, uh, I, I'm more than happy to answer those and I encourage questions. Uh, it makes it much easier and more fun for me, frankly, because talking at you uh, for this entire CLA is not, not really what I want to do, although, of course, I'm happy to do so. Um, so, you get to a point where you have a judgment 
Uh, the other side, you write to the other side, you say, I have a judgment, you need to pay me X amount of dollars by X date. Um, and they say, no. What do you do now? Uh, look, uh, to begin with, a personal favorite of mine really is uh, an enforcement hearing. Now at an enforcement hearing, uh, what will occur is you get an order from the court. The court requires and compels uh, the other side to uh, attend, be it a director or an individual. That person will then attend. They uh, have to submit in the ACT a statement of affairs seven days before that attendance. Uh, you will then essentially go through as a solicitor or, or as a person who's uh, the uh, enforcement creditor. You will then go through that statement of affairs. You will appear before, if it's in the magistrate's court, a magistrate, and you will talk to that statement of affairs and work out essentially what this person or this company can pay. Um, it is often the case that this ends up in, in instalment orders. Um, and it's, it's a bit of fun, to be honest, if you don't have a lot of skin in the game. Um, it's often the case that uh, the enforcement debtor, uh, as the company with the judgment against them or the person with the judgment against them is known, um, you know, muffs the figures a little bit. Uh, it's often, you often ask questions about whether or not this is true, whether their expenses are really that. Um, you know, whether their, their income is what they say it is, whether they're actually unemployed even. Uh, and it's essentially up to the magistrate when you make an application to seek an instalment order off the back of that or, or a lump sum payment or what have you uh, to determine whether or not what's been said is truthful. Um, I find that, it, well, it is quite effective. If you imagine it from the side of the enforcement debtor, you put them on their feet. They have to attend court before a magistrate. It's often quite stressful. Um, and you often get a result out of it and even if it's an instalment payment at least you know you're getting paid some money. You can claim some of the cost back for it but it depends it's often uh, not as much as one would like and not as much as the work that is put into it so it's always good to have a good relationship with your client or a good relationship with your solicitor in order to talk about those fees especially off the back of say protracted litigation um, you know you, you can often work it out between yourselves based on whatever the court schedule fees are. Um, now, problems with enforcement hearings broadly are one that you need to serve the other side. Um, that can be difficult. I mean, for example, if you have a case where you needed substituted service at the outset, um, having to go through that process again in order to get this, this person or this company served, company is easier, but this person served, um, is very difficult. Uh, it adds cost and it causes a lot of stress and problems and in the end it probably makes it not worth it. So I suppose in examples where you you know or you anticipate that you'll have difficulty getting service, uh, enforcement proceedings probably uh, isn't your best option. Um, it is the case that if you can serve them easily um, and they attend, that's when you can put the pressure on. It's often the case that people don't attend. I've been to many hearings where people have not attended at all um, and the court is empowered to issue an arrest warrant in those circumstances which is another good mechanism to put some pressure on um, but especially if it's a self rep if you haven't heard from them um, even if they have legal representation it, it can be difficult and it can take a number of appearances to actually get uh, that result, get them, get them arrested, get the police sent out to them, what have you. Um, and once you get to that point, I mean, in my experience, it's often the case that they probably don't have that much money anyway, but it is what it is. So enforcement hearings have great benefit, but in my view, only in very limited circumstances. And you really have to be cognizant um, of the strategy behind why you're engaging in that, because otherwise it'll just be a waste of time. Uh, and a waste of your money or your client's money um, and, and, and the court's time and it won't get you anywhere. And if you don't get anywhere in relation to an enforcement hearing, uh, what you then need to do is choose, choose another option um, under the enforcement mechanisms. Now, another option is a seizure and sale order. Um, there, there are two types broadly um, and, and they have different names in different states as well, but in the ACT, they're seizure and sale orders. Um, what that entails is essentially you get a certificate from the court. Um, the court, you then send that certificate to the sheriff and the sheriff attends the property of the enforcement debtor to seize and sell their goods. Um, 
sounds great, but in practice, it has, in my view, it has limited effectiveness. Um, so for example, um, knowing where that person lives, um, that they really need to own the property uh, to get the order and you need to be able to prove that. Um, it is unlikely in many circumstances, especially if it's an individual, that you'll know exactly what the, the personal property is, what its value is. Um, and in any event, even if there's property and it has value, there is still a procedure that needs to be gone through um, to sell that property and seize it. I mean, often as well for these for individuals, I'll get to companies a bit later, but for individuals, the, the sheriff will attend the property uh, and the individual will tell untruths and say, look, this is settled, I've already paid the money, it's not a big deal. And so you pay the sheriff to attend three attempts um, per each payment that you need to make. It's not a lot, but it adds up. Um, one attempt, you know, they, they tell an untruth. The second time you talk to the sheriff and you're like, no, it's not true. And then they go back and they're like, oh yeah, no, it hasn't settled, but you know, this is my property, it's, it's my wife's, it's my husband's, whatever. Um, so then the sheriff's like, well, I can't seize that, can I? Um, so you have to engage in searches to prove that it is actually the correct property. And then the third attempt they'll attend again, there's probably some other excuse. Um, and then you have to well, essentially refile the form. So on individuals, like I don't often recommend it and I don't see great value to it, but for companies, um, there, there is value. I think a lot of it's strategic rather than practical. Um, there are circumstances where let's say it's a construction company, it obviously will have in most circumstances plant and equipment. You can send the sheriff out there, the sheriff will be like, well, I'm gonna take all of that. Um, and then that will uh, put a lot of pressure on them. Even if there's the odd excuse, it'll put a lot of pressure on this company because they're like, well, this is my livelihood. Um, these are my workers' livelihoods. Uh, I, I really need to pay this debt. Um, so even if uh, it's the case that, you know, this property subject to securities or otherwise can't be sold for various reasons, um, some of it probably can be. It's embarrassing and it is a, a strong stick with which, with which to hit someone over the head with um, if they are, you know, the director of a company, uh, for example. I find that it has uh, significant effectiveness uh, in many, many circumstances um, and I think often the view that I take with it is, well, you might not get a result from a, from a monetary perspective from the sale of those goods of that company, but you're probably going to get a result um, due to the pressure that you put on them um, through taking that mechanism. Um, another option available, this is uh, a pretty strong one. Um, and for a few of these enforcement processes, it requires a fair bit of knowledge about the workings of you know, the enforcement debtor. So for, to, to backtrack, for an enforcement hearing, for example, the point of that is to get information, really, um, about, you know, the financial affairs. And from that, even if you don't get an instalment order all the time, or even if you do, you might not want to apply for one, um, you can use the evidence that you get from that enforcement hearing uh, to, um, to use one of these other enforcement mechanisms. So an example of that would be a um, debt redirection order. Um, so that broadly speaking is uh, a, an order um, with respect to a debt that's income into an enforcement debtor and you can get an order of the court saying that should be diverted to me. Um, difficulty obviously is you need to know that, that that's something that's coming in. Um, how you find that out is, is often anyone's guess. I mean, unless you've had proceedings where you know that this is the case, or even you know maybe that subject to the proceedings to an extent or an ancillary issue to the proceedings, um, then you can work it out. But otherwise, you know, it's often the case that you do an enforcement hearing, you find out about this debt, you apply for a debt redirection order, and off you go. Um, it's quite a powerful one, but as I said, limited circumstances because you do need a lot of background knowledge. Um, and it's not often the case I have found that you have that background knowledge um, and it's not easily easy to find. Um, unless your client has a strong um, idea. You can otherwise uh, get an earnings redirection order. So this applies specifically or importantly to individuals. So once again, requires some background knowledge. You need to know uh, if they're employed and who they're employed by. But if you know that this person is employed um, and if you know that they're employed by a, a certain entity, 
you can apply to the court to seek that uh, their earnings or a percentage of their earnings uh, is directed straight to you. Very good, very powerful. Um, I find that this one often has the most benefit to many clients for, for many debts. Um, the difficulty obviously is knowing where they work. Um, it could be the case that, that for this, instead of going the enforcement hearing route, um, as I said, fraught with danger because people often don't appear, um, you go down uh, the route that involves, um, you know, maybe a skip trace. Um, you know, if, if you want a referral, please reach out to me. I know many, many good people who do uh, very good skip traces. They'll be able to tell you. Um, you'll then get the form, um, issue it to the employer. And the benefit of this is once you get that order, there is an obligation on the employer, not the enforcement debtor, to... Um, Thank you, Mark North. I, I appreciate the compliment on my moustache. Um, for, for, I'll, I'll digress, I'll digress. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I had, I've experimented with my facial hair recently. I had a moustache that was uh, long and luscious for about 12 months, but after constant uh, and sustained criticism, I uh, removed it, unfortunately, um, and I don't think I've ever forgiven myself for it. I then grew a beard, got rid of it, and now it's November, so I'm bringing back the mo. We'll see if it lasts. My partner's not a big fan of it, so I'm not sure how I'm gonna go. Um, but in relation to the redirection orders, yes, you can get a skip trace, um, and that can tell you who the employer is. It gives you, it gives the uh, employer an obligation uh, to, um, to pay money uh, to uh, you, um, and it also uh, gives the employer an obligation to um, inform the court and inform you if uh, the uh, employee or the enforcement debtor ceases to be employed. Um, so it's very powerful, very strong. And from, from a strategic perspective, I think this is kind of the gist of this CLE, that enforcement mechanisms have strong strategic value in many, many circumstances and should be seen as such. Um, I often don't find that enforcement proceedings generally um, result in very strong results. Um, they result in, you know, instalment orders, orders that satisfy your debt over a period of time. But, and that's the case if, you know, the enforcement debt doesn't have a lot of money and it is what it is. If the enforcement debtor does have money that it's not telling you about it and not telling the court about it, um, putting pressure on them uh, often ends up in you getting a lump sum payment and you're getting paid earlier. So for example, in a in a earnings redirection order, if you uh, what happens is this employee, this enforcement debtor, has to have a conversation with the accounts team uh, at their work, and the accounts team is like, "Hey, is, is this a legit? That looks legit to us. It's a court order. We're being sent it by lawyers or whoever." Um, and then they have to have a very awkward conversation with the accounts team about the status of their finance. Um, and it may be that the uh, enforcement debtor informs, you know, the accounts team at their work that they don't have the money. Um, and to avoid all this, all you have to do is pay the debt. So it's often the case that you get an earnings redirection order, you get a few of them in, and then the rest of the debt's paid. If not, great, you've got an, an obligation on the employer to keep paying the debt and it'll be paid off over time, provided that the employee remains employed. Um, now, I'm no employment lawyer, but I understand and I'm told on good authority that uh, you cannot fire someone for these earning uh, redirections orders and nor should you. Um, so I think often you, you get a strategic issue with your client or a question from your client as to whether or not this will affect their employment and, and ruin any chances that you have of getting any money ever because if they're not employed, they don't have money, they won't pay you. Not the case, um, can't be done, shouldn't be done. Um, and if it is the case, then you know that employee will have their own remedies. But. It's a, I find that earnings redirections orders are, are very much a, um, a, a strong order that you can get. Um, I guess finally, I think um, I will end with um, seizure and sale of real property, different names, different states, but here it's seizure and sale of real property. What that is essentially, as, it, as you can gather from the title, um, is that um, Oh, just I have a, a comment on how we can support me for November. I'm about to set up a page. I was hoping for a little bit more um, support from the Chamberlain's office, but alas, no one, no one in Canberra at least is growing a mo with me. So I will set up a page and, and send a link shortly. I appreciate it and thank you for the support. Um, 
in terms of a, a real property um, seizure and sale order, as, as it says, um, you sell someone's property. That is a, a very good, very strong, very great mechanism. Um, in the States, often you need your um, goods redirection order to come back unsatisfied. Um, as I said, that often happens. And once that happens, um, you can apply for a seizure and sale of real property. Now, it's very good for, for companies or individuals who own property. Um, it is much easier to find whether or not an individual owns property than it is to find out what their bank account details are, um, who their employer is, because you just do a national search. It's a bit pricey, um, but it's often worthwhile. And then you get their property. Um, they'll be on the title. Um, hopefully, um, they're the sole registered proprietor. If pro proprietor, if not, you might have some issues, which I'm sure someone, possibly me, I don't know, will talk about in a future CLE. Um, but if let's say they're the sole proprietor, they'll often have a mortgage. That's fine, um, and you can sell the property. And from the proceeds, uh, you won't get paid. If there's a mortgage, you're not going to get paid immediately. Um, but you know the the mortgage will get paid out, then the sheriff's costs will get paid out, and the agent's costs, etc. Um, and essentially, but for any caveats or any issues you may have, you'll get paid the rest. Um, so it's a very very powerful tool. Um, the courts don't. Uh, make those orders lightly and you really do need to go through due diligence to do it um, But at the end of the day in my view, it's easily the most powerful enforcement process available to you um, And available to your clients and something that that should be angled towards from the get-go So when if you're a lawyer or if you're someone who's looking to sue someone you should probably get a lawyer but if you're someone looking to sue someone um, as I said at the start, you should look at recoverability from the get-go and you should have this discussion or, or this thought bubble about you know, how are we actually going to get paid at the end of the day even if we get this judgment. So a good thing is you, you do a property search early, you know that this person or this company has real property and you're like, cool, there's real property, it might be subject to a mortgage, maybe you know, once you get the judgment you want to reach out um, to the person with that mortgage and say, well, you know, we're looking at selling this property. What do you, what do you want to do? How much equity is there in it? Is it worth our while? Um, and then if you've thought about it from the start, you know, that this property, you get to the end, you get that property. Um, it works out quite well. It's something that, that works from start to finish and something that I prefer, frankly, as opposed to the other mechanisms, although they do have their value. For example, if someone does not own real property or if it's too expensive to sell that real property. Um, I specialize in um, insolvency, so uh, my recommendation often is, well, issue a bankruptcy notice um, once you work out if there's any money um, in what would be the bankrupt estate. Um, that has obviously been stalled as a result of COVID um, and, you know, the moratorium on essentially complying with bankruptcy notices being for six months, a minimum being $20,000. You can do stat demands as well if it's a company that owes you the debt. Um, I mean, I am biased, but those are the options that I prefer to recommend and that I, I prefer personally, but given you know COVID and what's occurred, it's not really viable at this point, unless you're willing to wait six months or otherwise wait until the 31st of December and see what happens in parliament. Um, so I, I've been forced to, with, with great pleasure, genuinely, I've enjoyed it, um, go down the enforcement proceedings route much more, much more often recently. Um, and it has um, reinvigorated my enjoyment of the strategic process around it. Um, and essentially the benefits that can be gained quickly if you really talk to your client or you really think about it yourself and work out what you actually want from this and what you wanted to achieve. It's often, as I say, not what the court is, is giving you, a installment order and an earnings redirection order that is important. It is the result that it gets through a lump sum payment, through further discussions, through increased lump sum payments to end the debt quicker um, so that people can move on with their lives. That is the true benefit of these enforcement proceedings in my humble view. Um, so as I said, it is, it is something, this is something that should be um, talked about from the outset when one, in my view, is advising their client or having a chat with their client and managing expectations, frankly. Um, and I think that if everyone is on the same page about enforcement, about how you're going to get paid, about what you know, the value of this whole process is um, to everyone, then it leads to well, a, a better client relationship 
um, and, and a long-term relationship between you and your client and it avoids litigation fatigue, which is the real, the real killer, if I can say that much, um, in, in litigation. I mean, at, at some point you throw in the towel and, and often it's enforcement proceedings because you've just had enough. Um, so if you know that it's coming and if you've done your thought strategic process around it, it actually has great benefit instead of being an onerous, um, burdensome, you know, process of advice and discussions, it, it becomes a strategic um, interest, which is more valuable than just demanding, you know, I, I need my money now, you know, this isn't good enough. Um, I, I hate the court process. This is ridiculous. I have a judgment in my favor, all of those things that I'm sure we all get from time to time. So um, turn enforcement into into a valuable process, into, into a process and, and a discussion that, you know, is strategic and, and you know, not fun, um, but at least not as painful um, as it otherwise otherwise would be. Um, so thank you, thank you so much for joining me. I apologise for the numerous technical difficulties. I am fairly new to this, especially in the Chamberlain's um, intranet. I understand from our, our website and our posts that this will be the last CLE of the season. Um, and I'm excited to be the last one to present. I, I put it off, but uh, I think it's been a lot of fun um, and I hope that we're back very soon. Um, I would look forward to comments and suggestions about whether or not you want me to delve down into the different processes a bit more um, in the future or otherwise, you know, whether or not you want me to speak about something else um, and I'll take it on notice and, and see what we can do next time. But I appreciate the support. You all have been a lot of fun um, thank you for the questions. Thank you for the comments on my moustache. It's interesting. I'll keep growing it. I'll keep growing it and let you know. I'll take a, I'll set up my Movember page. I'll take a few photos and, and I guess, you know, it'd be nice to have a wider audience with respect to my moustache than what I had previously when I copped so much criticism. So thank you so much. Um, have a wonderful day and I'll talk to you later.